Hi everyone, I'm Jared. And I'm Joel. And we're going to give you a presentation on deaf and hearing impairments for your students in physical education. First, let's go over a little background information on deafness and hearing impairments. They're both defined by IDEA, and deafness is viewed as a severe hearing impairment where individuals have impairment processing linguistic info through hearing. And then a hearing impairment is going to adversely affect a child's educational performance. That can be permanent or fluctuating. And then with deafness, whenever we see that capital D, that's going to be people that identify with deaf culture. And that's kind of its own thing compared to just a lowercase d. Next up are some characteristics of children with hearing loss. We have five different levels. The first one is mild hearing loss, which is only 15 to 30 decibels, where they struggle with hearing faint speech, and they kind of develop speech and language normally. Then we have moderate hearing loss, 31 to 60 decibels lost, going to be a little more reliant on those visuals. As soon as we can get hearing aids uh, for these individuals, especially as children, that's very beneficial. They might have delayed speech and language skills in school, and it's important to have preferential seating in the classroom where they're as close as possible, usually to the board or to the teacher, whoever's presenting. And then next up, we have severe and profound hearing loss. And remember that the degree of an individual's deafness is determined by the level of decibel loss and their ability to perceive conversation. So on this one, they are going to have difficulty hearing conversational speech, and they can somewhat respond to close range, high intensity sounds if they have that amplification. They're going to require modifications and assistance in the educational setting, which is going to be things such as uh, speech and language therapy, and then that amplification that was measured. And then profound hearing loss, 91 to 120 decibels lost, very much reliant on tactile and visual cues. And then they often need to use total or manual communication. Manual is going to be sign language along with some spoken language, whether it's mouth or actually said. And then total communication is going to incorporate lip reading, speech, and sign language together. And there might be some intelligible speech there at this level, but not always. And our last and fifth level of hearing loss is total hearing loss, where it's over 121 decibels. These individuals are unable to hear even with assistance or application, and they are going to rely primarily on vision to pick up cues and go about their everyday lives. Just a little overview of hearing impairments in general. Over 77,000 students are, receive educational services due to deafness or just hearing impairments around the U.S. And also, besides just students, one in four Americans suffer from some type of hearing impairment or deafness. The three major types that we're going to talk about of hearing impairments is conductive, sensorineural, as well as mixed hearing impairments. The first type of hearing impairment we're going to go over is conductive hearing impairments. This is where the intensity of the sound is reduced before reaching the inner ear. Some of the causes of this, the most common type is otitis media. This is the infection of the middle ear, and this can be really problematic as a young child if they suffer constant ear infections. And if this continues with all these infections, the student will really start to struggle identifying and recognizing speech as they continue the other major type is mastioiditis, and this is where there's chronic inflammation of the middle ear and it spreads over to the mastioid process in your skull. Uh, some of the other conditions of this would be a blow to the head, allergies, tumors, foreign objects such as insects getting trapped in your ear at some point, as well as excessive wax buildup. The next major type of hearing impairment we're going to go over is sensorineural hearing impairments. This causes a filtering or distortion of sound as it goes through the ear, and this is mainly due to uh, a malfunction of the sensory unit or a lack thereof of having a sensory unit. Uh, it, when there's damage to it or a malfunction, this is usually in the cochlea, and it can really lead to trouble of interpreting high-frequency sounds. Some of the causes of this can be some certain diseases like rubella, venereal disease, tumors, mumps, meningitis, the list goes on, head trauma as well. Uh, a primary cause, though, can be intense or constant noise. So if, as a child, they're growing up next to a loud factory or have environmental issues where there's constant loud rumbling noise, it can really affect them in this way. 
The last major type we'll go over is mixed hearing loss. This is a combination of conductive and sensorineural hearing loss. Often the conductive hearing losses can be treated in some cases. However, the sensorineural effects that happen are often permanent, and this is due, as we talked earlier, with the constant noise and damage that's caused to your ear and hearing system, the sensory ones are often unable to reverse once that damage occurs. And there's also another type we're not going to talk about, inductive hearing loss. It's not one of the major ones. The three major would be conductive, sensory as well as mixed. The following are some safety concerns that the book kind of went over as well, and how hearing loss may negatively affect our students in the classroom. And the following areas are just comprehending class material, whether that's in PE or general education, following directions, adhering to class rules, displaying uh, behavior that's appropriate for their age, participating in class discussions or some of that group work, interacting with their peers, attending to stimuli in the learning area, whether that's um, excess action or other things going on, um, expressing or understanding emotions and displaying those correctly, and then acting out behaviors as well may be shown. Some more safety concerns we have. One of the biggest ones with deafness is uh, students have real trouble keeping their balance. So you really want to test to make sure to see if they have any motor vestibular delays. And if they do in fact have vestibular delays, this will cause problems with their balance in most cases. You also want to develop non-auditory procedures for the class. This goes for starting and stopping activities, gaining the attention of the class, maybe using your hands to guide the class one way or the other. Anything that isn't going to involve noise needing to be used to get the attention of your class. Students also may need cochlear implants, especially with sensorineural hearing loss. In this case, you're going to want to avoid heavy contact sports, especially to the head, because it can cause severe damage if they receive a hard blow to the head and they have cochlear implants in. You also want to monitor sweating because it can create really annoying, unwanted noise for the students. And you also may want to make sure to remove that device for aquatic activities as most are not waterproof. Some teaching tips for your students with hearing impairments. You want to always face the student when talking to them and try to talk one-on-one -on -one with them when possible so that they're not distracted and your eyes are on their eyes. You, you also, as the teacher, when teaching them, want to be facing the sun. You don't want to have their eyes going towards the sun when you're talking outside. And avoid chewing gum or having your hands near your mouth. It's also important for you as a teacher to learn some of the basic sign language signs. And this isn't also a bad idea to have your general student population learn some of the general signs so they can help communicate with their classmate who has a hearing impairment as well. Also, don't be afraid to ask the student what their preferred communication method is during class. Also, you want to always make sure to have lots of visuals and demonstrations when possible for your students. This gives them something to look at when you're not always available or attentive to give them one-on-one. -on -one. If you have a visual up for them to look at, it can really help them go along. And demonstrations give them a way to see without having to hear what you're saying. It's also important to utilize familiar routines and signals for starting and stopping activities and try and use scoreboards and large timers when possible. That's again along the visual aspects so that they have something they can look at when you're not available to help. Lastly, we're just going to cover a surprising fact that sign language is not actually universal. Uh, ASL or American Sign Language is what we commonly see here in America and that's very similar to French Sign Language which is due to the founder of the first school for the deaf in the U.S. being from France. But there's also other types of sign language that all have their own intricacies and their own way of doing things, just like spoken language. And some of those other types are British, German, Japanese, and Brazilian. So there's more than just that American sign language. Thanks for watching our streamcast, and we'll see you in class on Thursday.